Fruity Knitting. This is episode 89. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And today's episode is called Shetland Lace at its Best. We have two feature interviews and you're going to see some exceptional Shetland Lace knitting. So Dr. Carol Christensen, who is the curator of the Shetland Museum and Archives, is joining us in one of those interviews to talk about her lace assessment project. So the Shetland Museum has a very large collection of traditional Shetland lace objects which all needed to be properly assessed and recorded and photographed and catalogued and as Carol and her team have been doing that they've come across some very unusual and rarely seen lace objects and techniques and part of their research has been to chart and rework these lace motifs in all of their variations so that eventually they can be published in a book and made available for future knitters to use, which is a super exciting project, can you imagine? Mm. But it's also a really challenging project. And in the interview, Carol tells us what she's particularly finding uh, challenging about the project. But we also get to see just so many beautiful examples of extraordinarily la extraordinary lace knitting and the charts and the swatches that they've been reworking from that. So it's a very interesting interview. The second interview is with Helen Robertson. And Helen is a Shetland artist who grew up surrounded by traditional lace knitting. And she now incorporates this lace knitting heritage of hers into her work as a textile and jewellery artist. But Helen is particularly passionate about celebrating and remembering the personal lives of these highly skilled Shetland knitters because they were making the most extravagantly complicated and beautiful and ornate and opulent shawls and garments while in many cases themselves just living in extreme poverty. So I think both interviews just really complement each other very well. Helen's is from a very personal perspective and it's very reflective and the other interview with Carol is more from an academic and analytical standpoint. So you put them both together and you get the complete Shetland Lace experience, which hopefully will leave you feeling very inspired and slightly overwhelmed. Yeah, and we are going to start with some Shetland Lace, but this is definitely not at the top of its class because we're starting with me in under construction. If you watched the last episode, you'll know that the latest project in my apprenticeship is a lace scarf um, featuring the bird's eye pattern. Now, um, this is a bit crazy because I've never done any lace before and the bird's eye pattern isn't meant to be relatively difficult, so we're a little uncertain about how things are going to go here. I'm not sure what you were expecting to see in this episode. My expectations were really that I would have some sort of moderate success, and I think that's pretty much what I've achieved. When I started off, I really didn't do many stitches before I made a mistake and fixing lace mistakes is really hard. So, so I had a routine where I would just knit as far as I could. And when I made a mistake, I just did garter stitch yeah. rows and to sort of clean it up. And then I'd start again to make a barrier. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's a close up of my swatch. This is full disclosure, complete transparency here. It goes <laughs> right back to the bit, very first lace stitches that I've done. You can see I get a couple of rows done and then we get a row or a couple of rows of garter stitch and then another attempt and then another couple of <laughs> rows of garter stitch. They do sometimes lengthen out <laughs> the successful periods. The last attempt that you can see here is about 24 rows. And in that time, I think I made about three mistakes. One of them I recognized myself very quickly after I'd done it and I was actually able to pick back about two or three stitches and fix it up, which I think is amazing. Um, one of them was much further back and Andrea wasn't around at the time. So I just didn't worry about it. And I just, I, I had one stitch too many. That's how I knew something had gone wrong. And so the next row, I just put in an extra decrease somehow <laughs> and continued on with the pattern. So it's a bit of a mess there. The last one, I'd really made quite a lot of good progress and yes. I was kind of happy with it. And then I made a mistake and it turned out I was nearly at the end of the row and the mistake was right at the beginning of the row, which was kind of sad. Fortunately, Andrea was able to pick back the entire row and then I could fix it up and, and go forward again. So that was really good. I yeah, am... I mean, it does help. The big thing you need to do is just knit a little bit looser and then yeah. it's easier to unpick and understand what, what yeah. decreases are what. Yep, yep, yep. So I'll try to do that. I am working without a lifeline. Um, this is just a swatch. It's not the real thing. I'm not all that worried about making a mistake and I, I'm not worried about these little rows of garter stitch in there. 
Um, and I do have Andrea next to me or somewhere around to help me out occasionally if I make a mistake to fix it or just to help me if I get confused, which does also or happen. Or to pat your back. Yeah, that too. <laughs> um, when I do the real project, I probably will put in a lifeline, although I don't know how frequently I will do that. I, in the past, when I've used a lifeline, I found it kind of annoying, so we'll see. Um, from going through this pattern a couple of times, I have recognized a couple of things which kind of make it a little bit more simple for me. I'm going to try to explain that to you, but rather than using this, I'm going to use a beautiful uh, <laughs> picture of a lace scarf, which came, uh, is the work of Lauren Anderson that we um, spoke to in the last episode. Firstly, although it's an eight row pattern, it's actually made up of two repeats of four rows each. The two sets of four rows are the same, but they're offset from each other by three stitches, which is half of the width of the pattern. So if you look at the finished design, you can see the two repeats with one set of holes sitting midway between the holes of the previous repeat. The second thing is in the last episode, I did mention that some um, lace patterns have lace stitches on one side and just either plain knit or plain pearl stitches on the other side, which is a bit of a break, kind of makes things simpler. That's not the case with the bird's eye pattern. If for the bird's eye, there is lace patterning on both sides of the fabric. But what I did see is that the wrong side pattern is always the same. It might be offset by these three stitches, but the pattern's always exactly the same. Mm -hmm. So that actually, if you take those two things together, it actually means that you only have three different rows. Yeah. You've got rows one, two, and three, and they're all different. Then you've got row four, that's another wrong side row, so it's the same as row, row two. And then you've got rows five, six, seven, eight, and they're exactly the same as rows one, two, three, four, but they're offset by three stitches. So, so that makes it intellectually more manageable for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very theoretical, but for me it makes it a little bit less intimidating, which is a good thing. Um, the one thing where I've not had a whole lot of success is to learn to read my knitting. Um, I can pick the, the yarn overs and I can pick the knit stitches, but this pattern has three different decrease stitches and I can't tell them apart when I look at my knitting. I think what I need to do is just spend more time um, after I've finished a row, I look at my work and compare that to the chart and try to line things up and learn from that. Um, Andrea did mention that my knitting is a little bit tight and that just makes it harder both to recognize the stitches and then certainly to unpick them. So I'm going to have to knit a little bit more loosely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm really enjoying it. Um, I can certainly see how people get hooked on um, lace knitting. I would say I can still see myself more in the realm of a scarf with a, a width of something like that many stitches and not a, a full-sized hat project. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I've actually never seen Andrew so so excited, actually, about a project yeah. as you have been about this. Yeah. I would never have believed it, but yeah. that's, that's great. Well, I, this sort of came from Shetland. I was really struck. I find these scarves in particular really beautiful. Yeah. And the other thing is there's, they're kind of complex, but there's also a simplicity there where you've just got the one colour and it's very regular and, yeah, so I like it. With these lovely little holes. Yep. Yeah, well done. Yep. <laughs> Okay, now for an update on my project, which is the Morning Star Bridal Jacket by Crystal Seyfarth. Now, this project is getting to be a big joke for me. I'm really enjoying it. I'm very excited about having the finished garment, and it is keeping me very entertained. But I have done so much ripping out on this project that it's just getting to be the biggest joke ever. Andrew often goes to bed earlier than I do and I, I will stay up and do an extra hour's knitting at night. And we've just got this routine happening now where in the morning he'll say to me, so have you knitted forwards on your garment or have you knitted backwards? Because for at least four occasions since the last episode, I've, um, I've had to rip back. So I'd, I'd knit for a full evening and then around midnight I would rip back to where I was the previous day. And sometimes those ripping back sessions have been because I've just made really stupid mistakes, like I've put some stitches in the wrong way. And with a pattern like this that's so broad and clear, if you put any of these stitches in the wrong place, you see them immediately. So it's interesting to note that the really complicated ferrule patterns, it's much easier to get away with little mistakes. You can sort of put a wrong stitch here and there and no one notices, but you can't on this. But the other reason why I've been doing so much ripping back is because I've been trying to make this design fit my body shape. 
So here's a picture of it for new viewers and you can the design is based on a traditional Danish bridal jacket which was worn on the island of Fenu. So it's a very fitted bodice and it's sort of like a corset and the jacket doesn't close completely across the chest. It gapes open and it shows another contrasting ferrule pattern on a knitted insert. So this design ideally suits a very classic hourglass fit figure. So someone who's got a very small waist and a very large bust. Now I do have a small waist, but I lack the large bust. So I have to be really inventive to get the same look. Now just very quickly to go over the construction again, you start the design knitting from the bottom up and you knit the peplum skirt here uh, flat so that's just back and forth knitting and then you do the three pin tucks in the contrasting colors still flat and then you join it together in the round to knit the bodice in the whole round and you've got sticking stitches going right up the front because it's going to be a jacket and I've also added sticking stitches on the sleeves with the armholes are the armhole shaping now the pattern doesn't say to do that it says to work in the round up to the armholes and then work the top front and the top back flat so that you'd be purling in ferrule I'm not going to do that I've decided to put these sticking stitches in so I can continue to work in the round up to the shoulder shaping okay so that's that now you'll remember back in the picture of the design that the garment or the design closes completely here down at the, the waist and it also closes completely at the, across the top part of the chest but it gapes open across the, the fullest part of the bust. How it does that is the shaping is done so it's narrowest at the waist which is just above the, the three pin tucks and then it gradually increases stitches up towards the armhole shaping but it doesn't increase enough for, for, it, for you to fit for it to fit you properly across the, the largest part of the bust and so therefore it gapes open. Now for me my problem is I can get it really well fitting around my waist and then I increase up so that it's fitting me properly around the lower part of my ribs but my problem is is that there isn't a big difference between the circumference of my lower ribs and the circumference of my fullest part of my bust. <laughs> So what happens is I only get a mini gape. It sort of only gapes to about like this, which is really unsatisfying. So <laughs> I've had to be very inventive and I'm gonna show you a picture now of my knitting so that you can hopefully see the shaping that I've ended up doing. So the smallest part is at the waist, just above the three pin tucks. Then I increased out to the fullest part of my lower ribs, but then I had to decrease back in again so that the section that goes around the fullest part of my bust will gape open wide enough and end up looking like the pattern intended it to. But then about one inch below the armhole shaping I had to very quickly increase back out again so that the upper part of the chest would be wide enough for me and fit me well across the shoulders. So a lot of this work is guesswork because you can see now that I've got my steak stitches in closing up my armholes I can no longer try this garment on so it all adds to the anticipation and excitement of cutting steaks open at the end and seeing if the goddamn thing fits you yeah. we'll all be <laughs> and, waiting and for if that. the gape is satisfying enough That's right. yeah. I might need a bit of help there yeah it's all about the gape um, coming up now is our interview with Shetland artist Helen Robertson at the beginning of this interview, Helen reads a poem by Paula Jennings. Paula wrote this poem specifically about Helen's work. This interview is a real Shetland treat, so I hope you enjoy it. The artist knits on her tiniest needles, frost shapes in silver wire, a motif from Tree of Life. Bone memories of Shetland lace dance through her fingers. Her foremothers gather curious ghosts. Beasts and boats and seasons move across their eyes. Shawls and socks grow from their never still hungry needles. The artist coats her shining webs with silver paste, lays them in a kiln. They bake to their crystalline past, but carry summer's warmth and light.
Welcome to Fruity Knitting. My guest here is Helen Robertson. Helen is a Shetlander and she grew up surrounded by Shetland knitting. She now works as a textile and jewellery artist and she incorporates Shetland knitting techniques into her work using both wool and wire, which is very interesting. So it's great to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thanks so much for coming and welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Good. Thank you. So like I said, you grew up in Shetland, but you spent your holidays with your relatives on the, on the island of Unst. Mm -hmm. So as someone who's got a long family connection with Unst, in your opinion, why did the finest Shetland lace knitting end up being concentrated on the island of Unst? Well, I think when you look at knitting, and I think knitting develops from the resources that you have to make it. And because Unst is the most northerly isle, um, the sheep have harsher conditions, so the winters are colder, the wind is fiercer, and so the wool is, as a result, finer. So the spinners in Unst had this lovely wool to spin, and they could spin it really, really fine. And it was able to be spun so fine, and then the, the lace knitting developed from that. And I think that they had, a, this is a bit of a joke, but my mum is for Unst, so I like to think that there was a lot of intelligence based in the island of Unst, which enabled them to develop the patterns, but also to memorise them. Because there was no, no, there was nothing written down. It was a time of like, harsh conditions. There was no electric light. There was no paper, or and everything was on slates. Or, but the the lace knitting and the patterns was retained in their memory. And I have here a sample of my granny's shawl pattern, and it just says shawl lace six hold twenty one scallops border ten shells wide. 13 deep, middle, 131 loops. And this is the shawl that she made, Faye, using that scrap of paper. It's tiny. So that's the pattern for that's this. That's the pattern for this, yeah. So all the actual technical detail of how to put the six hole lace, how to knit it, was just retained in their heads. And there was beautiful designs that came out of Unst. And uh, so fine was it that in 1899, there was a shawl gifted to Queen Victoria. Um, by somebody that was from Unst, was knitting in Unst. Yeah, and you were saying that there was a lot of fierce competition because living conditions were so harsh that that was another reason why they kept the pattern secret because there was a competition into being able to sell your lace. Yeah, it, I mean, knitting was vital to the folk in Unst and in the whole of Shetland, and there was competition. The merchants could criticise if it wasn't good enough and... Um, there was very little sharing of patterns between folk because they were in competition really with their, with their neighbours, which is kind of sad when you think about it, but uh, it was about survival. Mm. Okay, so all those factors together made it mm -hmm. really a centre of lace knitting. Yes, yeah. I think so, and there's, there's famous honest lace knitters. There's the Sub Sutherland Sisters and there was the man in Ewison that they found a whole lot of stuff in his... All that stuff is either in the local museum in Shetland or some is in the Unst Heritage Centre too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, now what about your journey into art knitting? When did you start experimenting with different materials? Well, I, I really started knitting, um, well actually in Unst, but at school we had knitting as primary children aged from about 8 to 12. We had knitting once a week, but that was always with Shetland wool and um, I liked it okay, but I didn't uh, enjoy it too much. Um, and then I went away to university, as a lot of Shetland folk do, and then I came back. Um, but I was unable to work at that time. Um, and my old knitting teacher came along and gave me a pattern for Fair Isle mice, which I have an example here. And I made hundreds and hundreds of these little mice. And then I got an order from the Fair Isle shop because I'd already sent a lot into Fair Isle but I got an order from the Fair Isle shop from 100 for 100 and that just tipped me over the edge <laughs> I, I couldn't have faced it because all the tiny ears are knitted and the heads knitted separately and it, the, the idea of having to do 100 the same thing again and again and again was too much but actually looking back now because I was because I was unwell then the, all the family, friends and neighbours they all came along we pillowcases full of old bits of yarn and scraps of yarn they'd had. So I had enormous range of colours, even just because it was small quantities, small mm. clues as we called them, small balls of yarn 
that they weren't going to use, and some of it was vintage because it was going back to the fifties and sixties. This lovely old Shetland yarn, and I made every most a different colour. So that kind of got me going with colour. But a few years later, I was asked by a friend to make a tiara for her wedding, and uh, it felt like a big responsibility. But it, the idea of this tiara for a wedding made me think about the women in Unst who had spun and knitted their own shawls. I mean, much finer than this one, like very fine, intricate lace, and they would use them to get married in. And we had a relation that had a beautiful one that ended up being sold. Um, and it, the sort of legend of that shawl made me think about how could I incorporate that into this bridal commission. So I used the lace, and I actually used the six-hole lace, which was in my... This is the this is shawl my granny made for my christening. So I used the pattern for six-hole lace, and I had some old beading wire I tried it out with, and then I got fine silver wire and knitted a tiara. And and it's similar to these bracelets, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I realised I realised that I could use wire then to make jewellery, and it would give folk a different way of connecting with Shetland lace. It was like a new audience kind of thing, and you could wear it in a new way. So I made a lot of... Uh, jewellery and now I teach folk how to make the, the jewellery yeah so. so then what happened with the oh, with the lashes <laughs> <laughs> that, was that sort of the next progression yeah it was the next step they were building the new museum and archives in Larwick and um, they were calling for artists to apply sorry to have art and craft in the building and I had an idea to create lampshades using Shetland lace um, at that time this this was sort of early 2000s. Shetland knitting was not very highly regarded by the general Shetland population. Um, it might surprise you to hear it, because I think outside of Shetland, it was always held in, in high regard. But within Shetland, the only time you really saw folk wearing Fair Isle was if they were going on a henny night or a stag night, they were kind of making fun of it. it they, okay. they classed it as fancy dress. Um and the uh, lace knitting was very cheap. Um, anything that folk made, they were selling it for hardly any money. Um, so I wanted to create a way of sort of making folk look up. They had to physically look up at Shetland lace and try and promote it a bit. That and so idea. the light behind is illuminating it again. Yes, <laughs> and actually the the wire, the the bracelets and things I made was on point two fine silver. But when it came to doing lampshades, if you hold wire up to the light, then it disappears. So I had to investigate and find a thicker wire. And the thickest wire I could, or the best material I could find was aluminium, because you can get thicker wire that's soft, quite soft, because it needs to be soft to knit it. And this is knitted on 0.7 mil okay. uh, aluminium wire. Okay. I have knitted on heavier aluminium wire, but it's really, really hard. And this... It was great, but it's it's quite a physical knit with the aluminium wire. So I was pleased with that project. And, yeah. Um, following and on, is that sorry, knitted in the round? It is knitted in the round, yeah. I, I didn't want to have a seam, so everything mm. is knitted in the round. Okay. And the ones in the museum are all, all knitted in the round, and each one is different, using a different Shetland lace pattern. And so what year was that when you did that? Um, oh, about 2000 and... Four or five, okay. maybe, I think. Okay. Round about then. And then you did another project that was connected to an old family croft, wasn't it? Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I had an idea, um, again, based on the same theme of trying to move Shetland lace into a different sphere and a different audience. And um, I wanted to... I'd read a book by Lynn Abrams about how Shetland at, in the... 19th century had three women to every two men and that the men had been lost at sea or they'd been in the Napoleonic War or they'd emigrated and so that left the women to were here and they were looking after the crafts and, and they were knitting and I wanted to kind of illustrate how some of the shit and lace patterns and the names of them is also linked to crafting and crafting um, it wasn't a cosy self-sufficiency well it was self-sufficiency but it wasn't a choice it was yeah. everybody had to do it to survive they had to grow their own food and they had to cast their own peats and again it was it was not a choice um and so i want the, my original idea was to get big pieces of fence and put them in 12 areas around shetland but i had difficulty 
getting uh, farmers, crafters to agree to that. So the idea, I just shelved it for a while, but it never really went away. And then I saw a rhyolic fence, which is like panels of wire, and realised I could knit within that and not disturb, it was be cattle proof and everything, and not disturb the actual um, crafter. <laughs> mm. um, and so that's what I did. I inserted pieces in, into a fence that surrounded an old craft, and the craft had an old ruined house. And in the window of the old house, I knitted a lace shawl, and I used patterns that was associated with the domestic environment. So I had a brand of iron lace and a brand iron with something they cooked on. So I had the brand iron lace and then the tree of life border and then a candle lit middle. And that was inserted into the window of the old craft. Um, and then my mum is into family history. So she researched the house and she found that in 1901, who was living in the house was a widow and her four daughters, and the daughters were all in the thirties. And the youngest daughter had been born when the when the mom was pregnant. She lost her husband and her brother and her father. And all the women gave their occupation and the census as it was works on own account at home knitter. So it just it still kind of gives me the shivers when I think about it because that five women were. Um, surviving through yeah. knitting on that very house that I'd put in there. So it, it, then it became like, it felt like a, well, it was a, it was always a tribute, but it felt closer. Really like a tribute yeah, and a very yeah, strong emotional closer. connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a yeah. beautiful story. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, and what about this here? What, how did this develop? Well, the next project I was involved in was one called Farlin, and it was between Shetland Arts and Fife Arts, and they paired poets and makers, they cross paired poets and makers with Fife and Shetland. And I was paired with a lady called Paula Jennings, and she sent me small books of poems, and I sent her some jewellery. And it was great because I hadn't connected with poetry since I'd been at school so it got me right back into reading poetry again and um, her poems are very visual and there was one that really spoke to me and it was um, Seabird what has death left in your belly and the first line is uh, the artist has tunnelled your head to a circlet of bone for the beach to wear a beat ring for death to rattle on his sigh and that brought to me images that I'd seen at birds lying dead in Shetland and usually in Shetland a lot of the time that's caused just by bad weather mm-hmm. really bad weather but sometimes it can be connected to oil too and um, so I put a monopoly in the poem there's a dog in the belly of the bird because she wrote it after a Salvador Dali painting ah. that has a dog in the belly okay. so I put a monopoly dog in the belly of the bird to link it to oil and um, greed I suppose yeah. And now it can be quite a lot of plastic that's causing seabirds to die. Yeah. And yeah. this was knitted, it, it, and apart from the ribs, everything is knitted. And it was, I used one ply um, silver wire, and I two ply and three ply, and then I oxidised it, which makes it go black. So when you say one ply, that's just like one strand and then you've held two strands yes. together and then three, three. strands mm-hmm. here. Yes, yeah. that's right. It's really beautiful and it just sort of flops in a natural yeah, way. Yeah, thank you. It? Yeah, I, I, it needs to be handled, I think. it's a, It, it freaks some folk out. Yeah, <laughs> some folk really hate it and some folk really love it. Yeah, I but, love it. It actually no, does you. remind me exactly of what you find on, on beaches mm-hmm. and as you're yeah, it is beach a combing. beauty about it, I think, in death. I think that's what... Yeah. Can I think bird skulls are generally like that too. They're, yeah. They are beautiful. It's very beautiful. And that kind of laid me on to doing more... I did more bird things. I made feather earrings and okay. skull brooches and... Okay. Um, that's this that, here. Yeah. Just based on the skull again. And this was more, I left the wire, I left the ends because it was more about reaching back. I think, um, yeah, it was more about eternity, I think, the leaving the ends, showing how it was how it was being made. And then this is tang or seaweed, as we cut in Shetland, and that's three ply hand knitted. That's really beautiful. Thank you. Well, I would just love to see how you I'd love to see you demonstrate how you knit mm-hmm. with wire or still and um, and just describe what the challenges are yeah that would be good 
So I, when I'm knitting with wire, I use fine silver wire, and that's 99 point whatever percent pure, as opposed to sterling silver, which is 75 percent silver. Um, the fine silver is much more pliable. Okay. Um, sterling silver would just break. And I use 02 mil, but in order to get a bit a bit more sturdier, then I use two strands together, usually when I'm doing my bracelets. Okay. Um, the challenge is with knitting with wire, you, you can't, if there's a kink in your wire at all, there's a good chance it's going to break at the kink. So you have to make sure your kinks are smooth. Um, it's good to pull down the wire after you've knitted it, and you can't do... Uh, three together. You need to do slip one, two together, pass slip stitch over. Um, I think the key thing to remember when you're knitting wire is it has absolutely no stretch at all. So if you're harsh, if you're fierce with it, it's just going to break. Um, if you do make a mistake, you can't take it back and re-knit with the old wire. You have to remove that wire and join a new wire and uh, start again because it's it's going to be full of kinks and it, you never get that it's like the wire knitting with wire leaves the story of the process in it so if you try and re-knit not like wool you can re-knit with your unraveled wool but you can't unknit you can't knit with your unraveled so wire. you can't do mistakes or no. you might be up for a more expensive no. <laughs> yeah 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 you need to concentrate Okay, um, now when you said you can't knit three together, mm -hmm. is um, why is that? What happens when you do knit three together? Um, it's, well, it's because there's no stretch in the wire, so you've got, you're, tr you're putting an awful lot of strain on the furthest away stitch. Ah, uh, of course. And it's just going to pull and break. Yeah. So it can cope We slip one, two together, but it can't cope with three together. Okay. And, and you use your knitting belt just yeah, like... Yeah, I use my knitting belt just like when I'm knitting We. We will. It's much the same process with this this thickness of wire. It's only when you come to the thicker wire that you need to use your elbows. <laughs> but this is much more just still with your hands. It's a slower process and you need to be gentle. But I, the thing I like most about it is you get something that can hold body and you can form it into different shapes. Mm. So I'm going to do two together. And it's just, you just need to be careful when you're doing that and not expect to be able to do it fast. So you're holding the wire in exactly the same way. You're just going slowly and smoothly to make sure yeah. that the... And I'm pulling down. See how I'm yeah. pulling that down before I put in the needle? Yeah. Because otherwise I'd be stabbing at it and then you, there's a chance that you can break the wire. So all your process is being done carefully in order to not break the wire. And then I pulled in the pulled in the row. So I'm using the thumb on my left hand to gently pull the stitches out and make it easier to knit. Yeah. So how long will it take you to knit a little bracelet? Oh, <laughs> depends if I make any mistakes or not. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're joining in a new yarn, mm -hmm. uh, a new wire, mm -hmm. um, do you have to weave it in or how do you join it or is it going to stay fairly solid? You don't have to worry about it unravelling? I would, if I was going to do that, I would break it and then I would join a new wire and then at the end I would sew it in just kind of like sewing okay. to secure it because yeah. it, it can come it can unravel if it's not secured yeah and make sure it's really neat so that it's not a lumpy yes but, that's the important bit especially mm -hmm. with wire yeah definitely so helen doesn't only knit with silver and steel she's still experimenting around with wool and she's actually come up with a new kind of knitting technique which is called fist knitting and it allows the knitter to have three colours in one row while only ever working with one or two colours at a time. So you've got a cowl here which you've done in this technique. Tell us about the technique, how it developed and, and yeah, how you how you do it. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I was, look, I was experimenting with slip stitch knitting and uh, I read a line saying that slip stitch knitting took the misery out of fair knitting 
because you can knit with one collar at a time and slip up the stitches. Um, and I, I didn't, I didn't really understand that because I enjoy fair and knitting and I enjoy putting as many collars in as I can, and I don't find it a problem to knit with two collars at a time. So I thought, well, maybe if I could combine these two techniques, then I could knit with three. I could get three collars in a row, but I'm only knitting with one collar or two collars at a time. So that was really what I did. And um, I'm just delighted because that's exactly what happens. I can get three collars in every row, but I'm only ever knitting with one collar for a few, couple of rows and then I can knit Fair Isle and slip up the other collar in the other rows. So. Okay. So since you thought of it yourself, you you probably needed to notate it yourself mm -hmm. and write a chart. So just you've got one here. Just explain how it's written. Yeah, well, I have a chart and I have at the age of the chart I have the collar that you're going to be knitting with and slip stitch charts sometimes are only the only chart one row but you knit the row twice you knit back and you knit back mm -hmm. but I find that too confusing to read so I decided to chart every row um, so the first two rows you're knitting with the dark collar on here and you slip up the other two collars and then for the next two rows you're knitting fair isle but you're slipping up dark color okay so here it shows you that you're mm -hmm. going to be knitting with blue and green yeah so and all the v's wherever the v is it's placed slipped. it means you slip that and in these rows it's going to be the black ones yeah i mean when i this is the sort of intermediate chart because i teach this too so the next chart which i would use I don't bother with the V's. I just know from the age yeah. which stitches I have to slip and which stitches I have to knit. But this is a guide when you're uh, learning the technique. Now, you've called it FIS. What does FIS stand for? Well, I've called it FIS really for want of a better name. I'd love a funky name, but <laughs> I've not found one that, that somebody else hasn't used yet. Um, it's simply Fair Isle Slip Stitch. Very simple name. But that's pretty good. It, well, it says It's to the point and it yeah. says what it is. <laughs> And, and what are you planning to do with it? Well, I have a list of about 50 patterns that I'm developing, and I've swatched some of them. I'd love to do a book. Um, at the moment, this one is on Ravelry, and I'm working. I have some that's ready to go on Ravelry, but I just have to go through the process. Um, yeah, it's enjoyable. I, I want to try and push it a bit too. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, it's been really great to hear about your work, and it's so diverse what you're doing. You, you, you. You're doing multifaceted kinds of knitting here, and it's yeah, it's been really fantastic. I think one of my favourite really is this kind of knitting art. Yeah, I, I do stunning. enjoy it. I do. Yeah, I do love telling a story. Everything I make has got a story, but uh, I'm not very good at getting the story out. So I need to. I need to do more work on actually telling my story so yeah well you've told your story a little bit today yeah. which we're very grateful for <laughs> thank you so thank you again for being on fruity knitting no thank you so we'll say goodbye to the audience okay. bye, bye. that you just heard was the Etude in C-sharp minor by the Russian composer Scriabin and we're having a very Scriabin themed episode this episode because I think Scriabin's music goes perfectly with Shetland lace knitting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Scriabin mainly wrote for the piano and when I was studying at the conservatorium he was my absolute favourite composer alongside Ravel. And I just think his music has such a bittersweet intensity to it, but at the same time it's very luscious and opulent and extravagant <laughs> and bombastic in a way. <laughs> and I think Shetland knitting, particularly the knitting that you're going to see in the next interview, it's, it's so intensely beautiful and intricate and opulent and extravagant as well and worn by the wealthy in many cases but it was knitted by people living in very hard and harsh conditions as Helen's just explained to you so that's also a contradiction that's bittersweet so 
I yep. hope you enjoy uh, Scriabin this yep. episode. Get to like his music like I do. Yeah, we had a really enjoyable time recording that interview with Helen. It was great to experience her passion for promoting Shetland lace to new audiences, including with her um, work with different materials. Yeah. I particularly loved her tribute to the family of the four sisters and their mother who had lost all of their men yeah. um, and were sort of struggling to make their living and provide for themselves just through their knitting. I thought that that picture of the lace on the fence um, was really evocative of an isolated Shetland croft, which is exactly where it was. Yeah. Uh, if you would like to see more of um, Helen's work, she's got lots of really great photos on her website, so check that out. Yeah, and also her fist technique was very interesting and innovative. And we've actually got a little bit of footage of Helen knitting with that technique and just sort of explaining how she's doing it, and that's available for patrons on the Patreon site. And also, Helen is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount on her fist cow pattern, so if you'd like to try it out. And as she said in the interview, she's developing around 50 patterns with this type of technique for a future book, so that's exciting. And if you're interested in purchasing any of Helen's handmade jewellery, she's also offering free shipping for Fruity Knitting patrons. So thank you very much, Helen. If you're watching the show, we do ask that you make a small regular contribution to help cover the costs of production. We've both given up our full-time jobs to do this work, and the show really is our product. We're not promoting anything else or selling anything else. We don't have sponsors, and we don't get any money from YouTube. Mm. So we really are completely dependent on patron support. So please support the show by becoming a patron. It does only take a small amount each month to make a real contribution towards keeping the show going. Yeah. And thank you very much to the wonderful patrons who've done just that and have made the show possible so far. We really appreciate you. Yeah, that's right. Regular viewers will know that Andrea has an almost insatiable appetite for hand-knitted socks. And you may also know that we have a sort of standing agreement between us that where I can exchange one pair of hand-knitted socks for a hand-knitted sweater, which I think is a really good deal. For you. <laughs> that's, well, yeah. You're happy? We're both happy. Yeah. I, I tend to only have one project on the go at any time, but some of our viewers have pointed out that I might want to have a somewhat simpler project to do in parallel with my more complex um, lace. Eye. Yeah. So, and um, I have certainly established that I can't do the lace in front of the television. So the result of this is that Andrea is getting a new pair of socks. And there they are. <laughs> The yarn that I'm using here is called Dorset Hike. It's from Solitude Wool. We actually spoke to Gretchen from Solitude Wool as our guest on Meet the Shepherdess in episode 72. Um, the yarn is a, it's an 80% blend of 80% um, Dorset, 20% nylon. Dorset it's, Hike, isn't it? No, just Dorset. Okay. The Dorset sheep. 20% um, nylon. It's a woolen spun three-ply um, what anyway, else? it's meant to be fantastic for... Um, it's meant to be a great hiking sock. Yeah, That's right. which I'm really looking forward so, to. Yeah, the Dorset fleece is, is a, they call it a downy fleece, so it's meant to be really cushiony and soft, but it is also very sturdy. This is spun up to be a hiking sock yarn, yeah. so hard yeah. wearing. Good hard wearing. And it yep. is, it's, it's very beautiful. It's also hand dyed, and you may or may not be able to see here that there's lots of lovely subtle colours in, in rusty sort of autumn colours. Yep. Which is great. Yeah. So tell us about the pattern. This Well, this is my first pair of hiking socks that I've made, or boot socks. So it's much chunkier than anything I've done before mm. in socks. Um, it, the pattern is called the Blueberry Waffle Socks Pattern by Sandy Turner. It's a free pattern. I think it's pretty well known. The waffle pattern is pretty simple. It's kind of a, a rib on only two rows out of every four. But it does give you a really stretchy sort of result and it's yeah. meant to give a really good fit. This one's standing up very well and stiff. That's because you're knitting very it's tight. super tight. They're going to last forever. So <laughs> they are. They're like cement socks, except for they're not. I mean, they're very soft, but they're going to be very hard wearing, which is what I want. Yeah. So I'm not complaining. Yep. Yeah. So they're coming along. It's interesting switching between the Shetland lace weight single and this somewhat chunkier yarn. I'm making really, really good progress on this. I think I should have them finished by Christmas and you'll be able to wear them 
on the mountains in Snowdonia does. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And you're doing the typical um, hill flap and, and turn and gusset kind yep. of sock, which I like. Yeah, it's great. We've had this yarn for a while. We've got two two different types of, or the two same balls. type of yarn, but different colorways. Yep. And one is meant to be for me and one's meant to be for you, but I wonder if I'll get both. <laughs> Anyway, well done. I'm looking yep. forward to them. So we've been running a patron-only knit-along over on the Fruity Knitting Patron Community Forum. <laughs> and this is a, a knit-along where you can knit any project of your choosing as long as you're knitting it with Millpost Merino yarn. So we've ordered some ourselves and this is going to be the jumper that Andrew gets in return for knitting me these lovely socks. I think he's getting a pretty good deal. Huh. <laughs> so there's lots of, of um, projects being knitted up on the forum so far and they're all looking lovely, so keep going. Now Harry and Murray are two Australian brothers who are working their sixth generation Australian family farm that's just outside of Canberra in Australia. And they farm super fine merino, Saxon merino sheep. And so if you haven't seen that episode, it's a Meet the Shepherdess episode, and it's back in episode 86. You need to go back and watch it. They're really funny, the two yeah. brothers, and <laughs> it, it's a good segment. And yep. there's just really great footage of the Australian bush as well, so I'm sure you'll really enjoy it. Okay, so this yarn has arrived, and I haven't actually knitted with Merino for quite some time now. I've just been thinking about it and I think in the last two years I've mainly been knitting with a variety of British sheep breeds. So it's quite amazing to me how soft this yarn actually is. Now soft isn't a quality that I normally actively go looking for when I'm, I'm picking a yarn. So, but it is quite overwhelming when you've got it in your hands and you think, wow, <laughs> that's quite soft. So I'm really interested to see how it knits up and, and how it's gonna look. So. I've, I've sort of pulled the plies apart at the end and I can see that it is three ply here. So it's been, pli three plies have been plied together and that makes it a really great yarn to knit cables with because it, it makes the yarn very smooth and completely evenly round and it'll give cables a really good stitch de definition. So I'm going to knit something that's um, cable-y for Andrew. So either a cardigan or a, a jumper. He actually needs yep. a cardigan. But I've spent quite some time mm. now just looking for a pattern that fits all the criteria we're after. So first of all, it has to go with this yarn. This is a DK weight yarn. Secondly, it has to look good on Andrew. Third, he has to want to wear it. And fourth, I have to want to knit it. And for me to want to knit it, it's got to be it's got to have a certain amount of challenge there, uh, be interesting and complicated enough to keep me excited. And I've just realized that there's such a lack of good male patterns for men. You know, like particular, there's a lot of really good basic simple ones that are just like classic designs, but sort of on the more complicated end, yep. there's very few to choose from, which, yeah, so there's a lack there. You've got to get out, design, call out to all designers, start designing for the men in your life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, what did I want to say? So I, I haven't had much luck there, so I've ended up coming back to Alice Darmore's Aaron Knitting Book, and I'm looking fairly seriously at her pattern, which is called Irish Moss. So you might be able to see here that the main front panel has delicate curving lines which sort of look like ripples on the water. I think they're very beautiful. It's all twisted stitch cables, but they don't actually pass under each other. They just kind of gently curve back and forth like a snake on the top. And also there's main thick bands of cables that go down into the ribbing and on the cuffs. I think that's a great design feature and it probably does the same thing on the neck band, but I can't quite see that. Now this garment is shown on a woman, but because it's knitted in pieces bottom up, it'll be really easy to adjust to fit for Andrew's silhouette. So coming up next is our interview with Dr. Carol Christensen. If you watch this interview and find that you've been bitten by the Shetland lace bug, maybe like I have, yeah. and you want to keep up with the progress on the lace assessment project, you can find or read about it on the Shetland Museum and Archives blog. Carol makes regular updates to that, and it's really interesting. So we'll put a link to that in the show notes. 
So enjoy the interview and we'll see you again in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm here again with Dr. Carol Christensen, who is the curator of the Shetland Museum and Archives. Currently, Carol is working or she's leading the Lace Assessment Project. So together with her team of three other lace experts, she is recording, assessing and photographing around 400 pieces of hand-knitted traditional Shetland lace. It's a two-year project and Carol has kindly agreed to give us an update on how the research is going and what they've discovered so far. So thank you, Carol. We're really privileged to have you on the show again and very grateful, so welcome. Thank you. So what is the aim of the project and who's working on the team with you? Well, the aim of the project is to record all of the lace held by Shetland Museum. And uh, we, like, you said, Andrea, we have about 400 pieces. Some of them are new donations, which we've never cataloged before, but many of the pieces we have were never cataloged properly. They, they don't have very much in the way of a description, nor have they been photographed. So we are doing all of that, and we hope to have a publication at the end of it, which will give us some more insight into how lace was constructed. So that's a lot of work. <laughs> it is a lot of work. And I have um, three people that are helping me. One is Tracy Hawkins. Uh, she's the collections uh, assistant on it. And then two craft specialists, Anne Jensen and Kathleen Anderson. Okay. So what do we already know about the history of lace knitting in Shetland? Could you just give us a very quick summary of how lace knitting has developed here? Well, we think lace knitting started in the late 1830s, just about the time that Queen Victoria became, uh, became queen. And um, it really is a Victorian fashion item to some extent. Uh, it had its heyday really between the 1840s and say the 1880s, but it continued on into the 20th century. And um, instead of a lot of shawls and stoles, which were common in the Victorian and Edwardian periods, it moved into blouses and uh, continued with christening shawls. Uh, it was a cottage industry, literally a cottage industry in Shetland, where uh, women would, mainly women, but a few men, would um, make, design, spin, knit the lace, and it was traded at local merchants and then it was shipped worldwide. Okay. And then it started becoming less popular at the beginning of the 20th century, would you say, when Feral took over? Feral did take over, but lace continued on, uh, mainly at a smaller scale because of fashion changes. But in the 1920s, there was... Um, uh, kind of a, a fashion to have women's blo what they called blouses, but they were sort of knitted, light, lightweight knitted jumpers that they wore. Um, and those were quite popular. Also, you, we see in the 20s and 30s um, dr uh, bed jackets, and they were sometimes edged in swan's down. Uh, and so it, it continued on as a luxury product, but not to the scale that it was 
in the Victorian period. Okay. So you mentioned Anne and Kathleen. So Anne Janssen and Kathleen Anderson are two sisters who are well known in Shetland as being expert lace knitters. We actually uh, featured them on Fruity Knitting back in episode 64. So if you want to have a look at their very beautiful work, you can do so in that episode. So the three of you are working really closely together. Can you talk about what each of you is doing and, and yeah. Yeah. Anne and Kathleen come in every few weeks and we get out uh, different pieces of lace and we discuss them together. So we lay them out and we look at them and in their entirety and we um we discuss how they were constructed in the patterns that that are that are there so with a stole like we have in front of us this kind of garment has a center which may have you know up to six eight different patterns in it it has a border which again has many different patterns in it and it has a lace edge so we look at those three elements and the patterns within them and then we start to choose which patterns we want to look at more closely. Now we haven't um, we haven't done every b bit of this particular stole. Um, what we've done is we've chosen this pattern and this pattern to look at more closely. And the way that we're doing this is that Anne is charting these patterns, and she's charting. This one, and then Kathleen uses this chart, and she makes a swatch. And then we bring these back together, and we look at them in comparison to the original. Um, and so we're trying to get accurate actual swatches and charts for each one of these that we choose. Um, so that's basically what we're doing. So you're choosing the more unusual lace uh, patterns that you're finding to chart because I suppose some of them have already been charted some of the very common patterns yes is that right? yes I mean there are other books out there with Shetland lace um, patterns charted in them um, and some of those were based on pieces from the collection but there are many many patterns in these pieces in our collection that have never been seen by anyone even Anne and Kathleen have been introduced to new patterns. And so we feel it's important to get those patterns charted and understand them and make them available. And of course, these charts will end up in the publication. Yeah, that's great. So what about this one here? So you've got, that's obviously Kathleen's swatch. Yes. And is that taken from uh, which chart? That's this chart here at the top. So this is the photograph of this particular pattern. And then um, Anne goes home and using Stitch Mastery, she charts this. And then Kathleen makes the swatch. Um, and this is these swatches are made out of Jameson and Smith uh, Two Ply Supreme Lace is what we've chosen. Um, and then again, we come back together and we look at we look at it and compare it. And in most cases, has there been has it been pretty uniform, or have you found some unusual? things happening that you didn't expect? One of the things we've discovered in charting uh, these individual motifs is that some of them are not completely centered and or within themselves they're not centered and and there seems to be an anomaly between the sort of beginning of it and the and the top the front the bottom of it and the top of it and what we what what Anne and Kathleen have discovered is that in particular in not not in stoles but in shawls where you have the border has to have a mitered corner that instead of decreasing or on the on the corners of it on each corner because the border is shaped like that there's decreases that are put within the pattern and this is done in a really complex way depending on the individual pattern. So sometimes it'll be uh, at the top of a, of a diamond, for example, because as you move upward, you need to decrease. And we found in one shawl, there were a hundred stitches that were decreased over the, the length of that border, over the, the width of it at the top, from top to bottom, which is a lot of stitches to get rid of. 
But of course, the patterns are really complex. And so these decreases are hidden in there by the knitter. And it's a really clever way to do it. So we're trying now to chart both the pattern as it is with those sort of embedded decreases, but also as it would be if you didn't do that, because of course the publication will be just individual charts that you can then use to knit the shawl that you want and um, will provide both. So if you want to use it in a border, then you can use that clever decrease. I can't wait for this book to come out. <laughs> that sounds so exciting. It didn't happen in every shawl, but we have discovered it now. That so, is, that's amazing. That's, yeah. That's really clever. Yeah. I can't wait to see it. Yeah, it is really amazing. Um, when you think about the design of it anyway and the construction yeah. of it, to be able to do that as you're knitting is amazing. Yeah. That's that's brilliant. Okay, and what about the shapes of the individual patterns? Well, the other thing we discovered was that um, as you as you knit, um, when you're knitting a, a whole piece, each individual pattern is affected by the other pattern. Um, I mean, an, a, an experienced lace knitter will know this, but as we create a chart which is singular. Um, what we what we see is that, and this is difficult to see in a way because the gauge is different. This is a piece in silk and it's very fine. And this is obviously two ply wool. But um, what we see is that um, this is sort of its flat uh, self in a way, whereas this has been affected by, partly by a repair, but also by the fact that there are two of them together and then there are stitches on, there's different patterns above. And the, the shape of those, uh, those individual patterns can change, even, even sort of at the top or at the bottom, depending on what's around them. And so this is something to keep in mind when you're designing your own shawl, that you, you, know, if you, you can swatch an individual pattern, but it may not look quite the same when you put it in a border with other patterns around it. Yeah, that's really a world, a deep world of lace knitting to learn about, isn't there? There's so mm. many things that just is layer upon layer. Yeah, and this is the beauty of charting, swatching, and bringing it back to the original and comparing, because you're starting to see things that you wouldn't have noticed otherwise. So many Shetland lace shawls are really complex with multiple intricate patterns just included in a single shawl, but crepe shawls are very simple in comparison and we've got two in front of us. So what can you tell us about crepe shawls? Well, crepe shawls, as you can see, are quite simplistic in their design, but they uh, had periods of popularity in particular late uh, Victorian period and the Edwardian period. Uh, we know from the research of um, Dr. Rosalind Chapman at University of Glasgow, who did her PhD on uh, the Shetland lace industry, that, that there was a demand for them in this period. But we also see later ones, probably 1940s or 50s, and we have an example of one of those here as well. The beauty of them is, that, is their simplicity, really. Um, as you can see, there's not a lot of pattern. This one in particular, it has a center and it has a lace edge and it doesn't really have much of a border. This one has a center and it has an old shell uh, border and then a lace edge, which is a bit more, well, both of these lace edges are quite interesting, beautiful ones. Um, the crepe shawls are very, very fine. Um, and they get their name really because of the, the drapiness of them, but also the word crepe comes, is a French word and it means wrinkled or curly. And that's to do partly with the garter stitch, but also these were meant to be, um, knit with yarn with a fairly high twist. Some are and some are not. Um, so the the reason they're called crepe is some people in Shetland don't use that term, but they have been known to be called that, and we call that we call them that in our catalog. Um, so crepe shawls, 
really are, um, because they're so plain, you really get to understand the quality of spinning that's done for lace. Um, and the spinning of lace is a really important element that's often overlooked. But the spinner was key to the actual execution of a lace garment. And without her expertise and skill, the designs that you see wouldn't just wouldn't be very wow. Um, and so in crepe shawls, you can sometimes tell where the spinner has gone a bit, uh, well, the yarn gets a bit thicker or thinner in places. This one's actually quite even. And this one is made out of um, a cobweb, machine-made cobweb yarn. So it has a few thick and thin places, but it's not hand spun. We do have other ones in the in the collection, which will be um, those have been photographed. And actually, I've got one on the the blog on the Shetland Museum and Archives website, which you can see in the finished product when we've photographed it in total, where the spinning got th thicker and thinner. And these differences are very very slight. The knitter was probably not aware of it until she finished it and dressed it. And by then, it's a bit too late. Um, and in that particular um, crepe shawl, I calculated that the knitter was knitting at a gauge of 45 stitches and 76 rows over 10 centimeters. And I calculated that in the center alone, she had knit about 260,000 stitches. So after all that knitting, she dresses it and realizes that the spinning was a little bit uneven and therefore um, the shawl isn't really what it should be. So that's the end of the relationship between her and that <laughs> spinner. <laughs> well, it just goes to show that you really need to choose your spinner wisely and you have to have confidence in your, in your hand spinner. Yeah. Um, and you know, hand spinners are human like everyone else. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> but yes, and you can see that it does show up more in the garter stitch than it would. You'd get away with more unevenness in a fancy pattern. Yeah, in, you would. Yeah. Um, I mean, we do have many examples in the collection of really fancy patterns where um, the spinning is uneven and um, and it's obvious. But um, and I think those are really interesting because I think they show skill level and that kind of thing. But anyway, the crepe shawls are really beautiful um, and they're quite simplistic. And I mean, worn with the right garments, they, you know, they would be uh, a pretty spectacular looking, looking piece of knitting. This one is probably um, a christening uh, shawl. Now, this one is interesting because it's got a center that's knit on the diagonal, still in garter stitch, but knit on the diagonal. And this seems to be a slightly later um, convention, maybe, like I say, 1940s or 50s. And, and Peyton's put out patterns for these, although they did say that, that, that this kind of thing had been in their collection for some time. Um, but also Sharon Miller has a pattern for a diagonally centered crepe shawl. So, um, so they're just another way to do it. Um, and they do look really quite interesting when you see it on the diagonal. I it think. does. It mm -hmm. looks it looks quite special that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, can you tell us briefly about one of the more unusual pieces of lace that you've been looking at? Like, have you found any surprises? Big surprises. Mm. Well, one of the most interesting objects we have in our collection of lace is what my colleague at Glasgow University, Rosalind Chap. Chapman identified as a Bernou. And a Bernou was an, a, a kind of a shawl or cape-like garment that was popular between 1850s and 1870s. And it's actually a Middle Eastern garment. Um, Britain being had, had the empire and this exoticism of clothing was really popular in the Victorian period. And so we see... Um, we see women wearing Bernou uh, as a cape, as a type of cape with a with a um, with a hood um, in this period. And uh, here's an example of of a picture of one that isn't lace, 
but you can see it's quite wide at the at the bottom and of course it it works well over these huge Victorian skirts because of course they can't wear a proper coat they have to wear some kind of a cape over over dresses that big but it always has uh, a type of um, hood that that hangs down the back and there's always tassels involved and this gives it its exoticism and we have one of these in Shetland lace pattern and it happens to be in red and white so um, this is what it looks like on a mannequin and um, it's quite a big garment and we've draped the hood as it should have been worn and you can see with this big dress that you see the beauty of it spread. And of course it comes down in front and there are tassels here and there are tassels at the back. Um, so of course as part of this project we wanted to examine this piece more closely and understand how it was constructed and it's really quite complicated. This top part here is, is the hood that comes down. Um, and it is very drapey in that way. Um, and the bottom of it, this is where it starts. So it's constructed with a lace edge and a red half of, of the border knit around this way, just knit long. And then uh, the white half of the border is picked up along here and knit up. And where there are live stitches here at the center, these are used to start the white stripes. And um, so they're knit up and then the red is added on and it's knit in to the white as it's knit up. So all the white is done and then the red strips, or at least they're begun, and then the red strips are begun. And here the shaping is done with short rows. And so all of this goes, goes up and continues up into the hood area. And then it has wings on either side, which are these front parts. And they're done with just increasingly shorter strips as you go up. So it's a, really a triangular shape with a big rectangular bit at the top. Amazing construction. The other thing that's interesting about this is that the three main patterns which are this one, this one, and this one, they appear in a, a publication by Jane Gauguin of Edinburgh, her, one of her knitting pattern books in the 1840s. Now this particular garment was said to have been exhibited at the 1851 Great Exhibition um, at Crystal Palace but we've never really been able to find evidence of that. Even though uh, many stalls were showing Shetland lace, there's nothing saying that there's a red and white Bernou there. So we don't know if that really is the case. It's a completely stunning garment, isn't it? Absolutely it, beautiful. It is totally amazing. And we also know that through Rosalind's research that, you know, there were special orders for things like opera cloaks, um, that were sent up to places like Anst and knitters were making, were making opera cloaks out of Shetland lace. So this is the kind of thing that would have been worn by a Victorian woman, say to the opera or just promenading in London. Wow, <laughs> that's incredible. Okay, well look, it's been so interesting this interview. I'm so appreciative that you've come on Fruity Knitting to share the research with us, it's really great. Just to finish off the interview, can you tell us what's proving to be the most challenging thing about the research for you? Well, the difficulty for me in particular is that I have to catalog each one of these pieces. And in order to do that, I really would prefer to be able to name the patterns. But of course, many patterns don't have names. So we've been trying to figure out how do we describe these patterns and I, I just don't want to have to give it my own name because that's somehow putting some kind of historical record on it that shouldn't be. So we've tried to do research on local names and one of the things that we've used is uh, a fairly new donation of probably about, well, close to 300 samples 
of lace stitches individually done and each one of them has a little label attached with their name. Now some of these don't appear in lace pieces that we have in the collection but we haven't actually thoroughly investigated all of these yet. Uh, I currently have a volunteer Helen who's coming in and she's blocking each one of these and we're photographing them but then Anne and Kathleen as craft specialists they'll come in and examine these and we're trying to match them up with pieces in the collection. But you can see here there's all kinds of uh, different sort of names to them. Uh, this just says a west side pattern, probably from the west side of Shetland, but we don't know. It could be west side of Unst. Um, this has got two patterns on it, uh, a knotty lace pattern, one and two. This one's called the skate's mouth, which is the fish, the skate, and it's his mouth. Um, this one's Granny's shell. So this is this is a version of old shell, but Granny's. And then this one is called the Slater, and Slater or uh, a Slater is a is a wood louse. So that's the shape of that one. So there's a huge variety of these, and like I say, there's upwards of 300 of these, and, and we're now just trying to get to grips with them. But the other thing we did was we had a, a meeting of lace knitters in Shetland uh, a few months ago, and I put up a lot of examples from the collection and said, what do you call this pattern? Especially the ones that we see over and over and over again. And we did get a lot of good information, particularly from Unst, but there were also disagreements, or we found out that in one part of Shetland it was called one thing and in another part it was called something else. So the naming is, is a complete nightmare in a way, and yet it's really fascinating. I can see that. I mean, the names in themselves are really fascinating and they show the, the connection between the knitting and, and the knitter's life in a sense, doesn't it? Like yes. being a fisherman or being a, a crofter or whatever. Yes. And and knowing about woodlouse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's really interesting. But it's also, it is a, a problem because they, the names happened organically, but you, to, in order to catalogue, you have to kind of get rid of some of that organic yeah. procedure, don't you? Yeah, and that's a difficult thing because, of course, we want to, we want to record the organic, but then, you know, just because it was called this for one shawl by one knitter doesn't mean it was called that for another. So I'm still trying to figure out how we're going to get to grips with this. Well, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be interesting anyway, whatever you decide on. Yeah, Thanks. That's great. Well, look, thank you so much again. We are so appreciative sure. that you've come on Fruity Knitting and shared this um, research with us. Mm. That's great. Mm. Thank okay. You. Well, I think we should say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye.